George Richel will be speaking with us. He'll be uh, demonstrating or showing us the technology and elaborating upon the, um, you could say, the good ideas behind um, affecting weather and our own health and well-beings. So, George, please come out. Thank you. Good to have you. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Dames and Herren, um, I'm very nervous because I'm not a regular speaker at conferences, so um, I hope it will not be boring. Okay, the um, term organ energy was originally coined by Dr. Wilhelm Reich, who used to be a close associate and assistant to Sigmund Freud. He was um, a um, psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, who actually, uh, due to his very curious nature, um, took Freud's uh, psychoanalytical um, theories a lot further and uh, in the course of his uh, research went from going to the, the actual physical, uh, when, when Freud was speaking of, of suppressed memories and suppressed emotions, Reich actually found out that this is a permanent um, tension in the muscles that can be liberated, so he found the connection between the free flow of energy in the body and um, the various um, psychological problems that people had. So, yeah, maybe, maybe it's a bit... Uh, I'm going to refer to this later. All right, so Wilhelm Reich said there is no proof, there are no authorities, whatever, no president, academy, court of law, congress or senate on this earth has the knowledge or power to decide what will be the knowledge of tomorrow. I think this could be the motto for our conference and for our movement because um, uh, we need to liberate science from preconceived um, ideas. The... Uh, many names of organ, I'm just uh, referring to a few of them. You see everybody probably in this room has had experience with yoga. The Vedic tradition calls this energy prana. In China it's called qi or qi. Ancient Greece and even recent Nobel Prize winning uh, scientists are referring to the ether. In Germanic mythology this all pervasive force was known as Vril or Ode. There are similar names to that in shamanic knowledge in Africa, where it's called Power, Mandla. Baron von Reichenbach, who re researched into this um, life force, called it Ode. Anton Mesmer, Animal Magnetism, Dr. Wilhelm Reich, obviously Organ Energy. Or uh, the more recent uh, names like Zero Point Energy by Hal Puthoff or uh, torsion fields, there are many other names, and we heard quite a few of them already in this conference. According to Wilhelm Reich, organ is the primordial energy, so it is not a new energy. It is not now we are using organ, now we are using something else. Everything is organ in that understanding. It's everywhere, it's all permeating energy, it's, it's the origin of all motion and energy, origin of all matter. In the living being, it's biological energy in the universe. It's the origin of the galactic systems. Um, so there are many links uh, between Wilhelm Reich's work that was actually um, brutally interrupted by his incarceration in 1956-57, where he died in prison. Uh, he also saw the, the aspect, the, the spiritual and the um, material aspect of it, so, um, Wilhelm Reich discovered in his medical research that living cells had an aura, and he was able to, um, to show that under high-resolution microscopes. Some of this work has been later replicated by um, 
Professor Di Meo in America. Uh, one of the very groundbreaking discoveries of Wilhelm Reich was the bions. He called bions lifelike organisms that he could produce from sterile matter. Even from this one is actually um, iron filings that were uh, brought to red hot glowing and put in a sterilized um, uh, natrium chloride solution and then grown over two or three months under the influence of concentrated organ energy and he could demonstrate again and again the emergence of life from non-living samples. Another um, uh, typical bion experiment that uh, Wilhelm Reich did was a sterilized concoction from hay that was um, sterilized in an autoclave and, and uh, where also um, organism-like pulsating little things that he called proto-amoeba. An amoeba is, is a one-celled organism, but they were not organisms, they were energy organisms. So, in effect, Wilhelm Reich demonstrated the genesis of life from non-living matter. We see here the, uh, the faint blue aura around healthy red blood cells. Wilhelm Reich showed that uh, people afflicted by cancer, this, uh, r this blue radiance and the blue uh, core of these blood cells would be gray in a person who had cancer. So he uh, wrote a book called The Cancer Biopathy in which he um, showed that um, cancer is actually an energy disease, a disease of energy stagnation. Okay. So um, he did dabble into the field that we would call free energy today, where you actually derive usable power. He showed that um, concentrated organ energy could be used to create motion. This is a replication by uh, James DeMio of the original Wilhelm Reich organ motor. Um, but he, he wasn't focused on creating usable energy, he was focused on healing people. Um, Wilhelm Reich basically said that um, the all-pervasive eater, the, the uh, organ, can be in different states. So. If it is moving freely, he called it positive organ, and that is the intelligent self-organizing matrix. That is the mysterious force that actually creates the visible universe and creates form and, um, and differentiates itself creatively. Then when this energy is blocked, and that can be on a medical individual level, it can also be on a global level. Uh, he called it door or deadly organ. Okay, so this is just a terminology that, that Wilhelm Reich developed um, that I wanted to quickly introduce. So um, one could say that um, these two concepts, positive organ, door and door, are related to the idea of entropy and disentropy. Entropy being the breakdown of order, the, um, the process of burning something whereby you bring something from a, a state of complexity and high order into a process of, of lower order whereby you liberate energy. Now entropy is basically the basis of our existing civilization. You can say that all machines that man has constructed so far, except for those that are kept secret, um, are based on the process of entropy. We are burning fossil fuel, creating um, uh, exhaust gases, which is a simpler state of the, of the material, thereby we liberate energy. Or we, we split an atom, uh, bring it to a state of lower energy and liberate the energy. So all these processes are inherently destructive. Whereas, um, so 
I learned that at school, I think 10th grade or something like that, that the entropic universe, which was presented to us as the only universe there is, the entropic universe ends as a cold and dark place because somebody who can only think in terms of entropic processes sees the world essentially as a battery whereby the two poles are connected and the battery is being discharged and when it's finally discharged, it's finished. The universe is cold and everything is dead. And I got very depressed when I heard that. So... <laughs> huh? No. Eventually, all, all charges are dissipated and there's no more movement in an entropic universe. But luckily, it's actually not like that, but there is a... So the, the, the embodiment of entropy on the planet is the desert. Or the desert actually was also called by Wilhelm Reich the cancer of the earth. So it's an energy disease. A desert is an energy disease of the earth. Okay, you see that here, the dead tree in the um, Namib desert. Um, but the mystery of life is totally unexplained by our conventional science because our conventional science is able to find um, fantastic uh, tools in order to, to tell you what amino acids are reacting with what other amino acids, but essentially uh, the vision that, that um, conventional science has of the human body is like my optometrist told me, I'm a bag of chemicals in the skin. Right? And I said, sorry for you, I'm not. <laughs> you know? So what I'm saying is the, the mystery of the self-organizing creative force in the universe is not understood by conventional science. And it is probably the origin of why we are all here together and dreaming or taking concrete steps into bringing free energy into real existence because we intuitively or scientifically understand that there is something else going on. Not just the burning and destroying of things. It's not only the, the predatory uh, or parasitic process, but there is a process that is growing from uh, this uh, energy. So I've taken this picture. Um, Katarina is here. That's when she was six years old. <laughs> um, that is showing a fig tree. And now you have to imagine this fig tree grows from a little seed that somewhere lands in the cleft of a rock. No living material and it creates this amazing uh, growth of roots and a fantastic tree out of that a little seed that lands somewhere in a non-organic rock. It organizes itself. It's, to me, it's a miracle, just like the miracle of a human being. Um, the social and environmental crisis, an expression of deadly organ energy on a social level, war. This is a recent photo from Libya, the town of Sirte, more or less looking like Berlin, 1945. Um, so, we believe that if this principle is of a universal nature, you can actually see it at work in society as well. Because if you have a mindset that um, only extractive processes are the only possible thing, then you will create a society that employs a lot of destructive processes. Um, now I'm getting to the classical, I'm not going to give a lecture on Wilhelm Reich, I'm only introducing him as the pioneer that, um, on whose shoulder we are standing in a way. The classical Wilhelm Reich cloudbuster was an array of um, hollow pipes, metal pipes, that were grounded with a very large uh, capacity cable to a water body preferably flowing. What he was doing with it was to, to find the places of stagnant energy in the sky and by, by using a sweeping motion, draw that energy in, bring it back to flowing. Because there is no such thing as bad energy, there's only energy that stagnates or energy that flows. Right? So this is a replication of a classical Wilhelm Reich cloudbuster by um, 
Joachim Trettin in Germany. Then what Wilhelm Reich found was that if you combined metal and organic material in layers, um, organic material would accumulate organ energy and metal would attract it and quickly repel it. So as you, as you layer this material, you could concentrate the um, organ energy inside this box. He experimented with these boxes. He got uh, spontaneous remissions of cancers and various other benefits. And um, that became a threat to the medical establishment. So they basically started shutting him down. That was the beginning of the, the FDA in America. He was finally um, prohibited from further making them. And um, uh, this whole technology went underground and was sort of rediscovered in the 1970s with the whole kind of hippie movement and so on. People started making these things again and experimenting with them. Um, then came along Mr. Don Croft from Idaho who took an invention that another gentleman by the name Carl Welts had made in the meantime, where he mixed um, ordinary resin and metal filings into a chaotic mixture and found that the effect that Wilhelm Reich had observed with the layers of organic and, in, uh, and, and metallic material was even more powerful if you mix, because resin is, in the chemical sense, an organic molecule. I'm not talking organic as, as in, in uh, natural. I'm talking organic as in carbon-based chemistry. Um, that this mixture of uh, resin and metal had the powerful property of drawing stagnant energy in and instantly transforming it. Right? So Don Croft combined this and... and um, Welts was limiting the application of his, of his discovery to um, applications of radionics. So he made organ generators in order to make sportsmen more successful, so more on the kind of self-serving side. Uh, whereas Don Croft immediately uh, surmised that if you combine this with the, the Wilhelm Reich idea of the pipes going into resonance with the sky, and the, the converting, organ converting uh, property of this organite material, as, as Carl Wells called it, you would have a very powerful tool for environmental healing. Okay. So the nice thing about Don's approach, and I think that is very important also for our um, uh, future strategy or tactics in the free energy movement, Don never tried to capitalize on his technology. He shared it freely and he actually spawned a worldwide, he actually doesn't like the word movement because movement sounds like you have a leader and then the, the underlings who carry it out. So he, he loves to call it a network. And in fact, there are about 10 people that I've met uh, in the run-up to uh, today who have already build their own organite and, and or come across it or apply it in their own environment. So I'm just going to show you the, the tools that we are using and then after that I will um, show you that these tools really work because that would be your next legitimate question. All good and fine, does it actually do something? And I'm going to show you that it does. And then I'm going to show you the work that we've uh, been doing in, in Southern Africa in the last 10 years. And finally, I'm going to show you how to make your own, because I want you all to go out here and be able to make your own simple organite tools and start changing your environment. So this is the so-called organite cloud buster. I've got one here. Maybe I'm going to put it on this side. So that it doesn't stand in the way. It's got um, copper pipes, approximately six feet or um, one meter eighty. These copper pipes are going into the organ matrix to about that much above the, uh, the bottom. And each um, pipe has a 
double pointed crystal in the bottom, embedded in the bottom, which serves as an energy amplifier or an energy uh, conduct. So basically it draws in the energy if you put it in a place that has very bad energy you will actually see a blackness in the sky that converges over the these cones that um, Don Croft called the holy hand grenade it's not referring to anything very violent, it's actually a Monty Python thing. Um, that is an organite cone that has um, a crystal pointing upwards and four crystals pointing outwards at the bottom. It draws energy in from the top and then distributes it laterally. And finally, so we can make them in pyramid shape, we can make them in conic shape, and then finally, we've got tools that are very cheap and easy to make, like this one that we call a tower buster. Tower buster is called tower buster because it was invented to neutralize the negative energies from cell phone towers, mobile phone towers. But we actually use it as a, as a very universal um, tool. We put them into large water bodies because water is distributing energy wide and far. And they come in different shapes and sizes. Um, we make very rough ones for outside, and we make some slightly nicer ones for inside the house. And another important one is the earth pipe, where you have um, a hollow pipe that is filled with this organite mix by about one third, and it has a crystal pointing downwards. And that one we use to hammer it into the ground for any negative energies that come from underground. You can use your own fantasy what that could be. It could be a secret military base or it could just be a negative water line. So um, the, this is basically the Earth's acupuncture needle. Um, there are other tools that have been derived from that. Um, cell phone protectors, pendants that you can wear individual healing tools for energizing the body, then a combination that um, uh, Don Croft developed also of the Hulda Clark zapper, some of you may know about zappers, with the organite technology so that it um, becomes not only an electrical healing tool but also an energy healing tool. Also there have been developed combinations of, of um, the electrically pulsed um, organ tools like the power wand or what we call the organ howitzer, which is um, a, a crystal with a special Mobius coil embedded in organite that creates a very strong protective scalar field, a field that is so strong that even I, who normally don't see auras and things like that, can see the energy coming out of it. So, but I'm not going to go into these more specialized things because I want to keep it basic and, uh, and the basic message of this presentation is that everybody can do it. It's not specialized, it doesn't need a, a rocket scientist to make organite and start working with it. So, um, yeah, that's basically the potential applications of organite. The possibilities are endless. Wherever the organ field needs improvement, organite will do it. That's basically everywhere. In agriculture, we uh, observe increased fertility, plant growth, biomass, plant health. Can be proven, can be shown. Desert greening, we had the pleasure of observing anomalous greenness of the Kalahari and the Namib Desert after we did work there personal health and well-being support healing processes, often astonishing results, even with dread diseases. We are not promising anything, but we have had feedback of spontaneous cancer remissions and things like that just by having some organite tools. I'm not saying this will happen all the time. Protection against radiation, dissolving chemtrails, immunizing a country against effects of weather warfare. That's very important. And then there are 
numerous effects on consciousness. We find on a regular basis that we get feedback that people who have been engaged in bickering and quarreling suddenly find it possible to, to work together or live together in a constructive way. After what we call gifting Johannesburg, a notorious crime capital of the world, some people say, with about 3,000 of these little things, we got a crime statistic the first time after a continuous rise over decades that went 13% down in terms of um, murder, manslaughter and robbery with aggravating circumstances. So here you can see the effect of Orgonite on um, cell phone towers. We believe that microwave radiation is weather modifying. There are, the jury is still out whether they do it deliberately or whether it's a side effect. I personally believe that there is a secret agenda connecting all these towers to a more sinister purpose. But be that as it may, that is not important for our discussion here. You can see um, this area of towers before and after. You see the sky is rippled like a herringbone pattern. Here it's already forming beautiful cumulus clouds. And you can see a vortex forming. You can see a blue hole emerging. This, these two photos on the bottom, I have to apologize for the bad quality. Um, they show the same site basically 20 minutes apart. So that's a very typical experience that we have had thousands of times. You can see immediate effects of Orgonite on a sky. This sky, I believe, was fully chemtrailed. It had like a, um, a level of chemtrails on top and other cloud underneath. You can see an energy flare here shooting up. In total silence, by the way, these, these occurrences are not accompanied by wind. It's a purely energetic uh, phenomenon. You can see here, uh, that was in Uganda in 2004. On this mountain, which was in a, in a closed-off military area, uh, there were several towers on top, and we didn't have a chance to go very close. The only thing we did was to place two of these about two kilometers two kilometers, and the effect was that. And this is not a tornado, this is not a hurricane, this is a silent energy vortex that came about in total serene silence. Yes? Oh, sorry. Better? Okay. So, another um, before and after picture. This was a um, military radar station in Tete, Mozambique. The whole city had a very, very negative energy. It felt totally oppressive even as you entered the city. You can see here the kind of sky that we saw. Here you see my wife, Friederike, hiding something in the bush. And then you can see how the sky opens up. Again, this sequence is not over a day or two. This sequence is within 15, 20 minutes. So you see the original sky, you see the ripples, you see how the ripples start forming into more articulated clouds. A few minutes later, you see the very typical blue hole, which indicates an energy vortex. And you see how this now healthier sky is forming into rain cloud, and as we drove off, Half an hour later, it was already raining. So that's a typical sequence of what happens. Another one here. It's often, it's not so easy to document, you know, because we are, we are, as we do these gifting expeditions, we are moving through the landscape. We're not just staying somewhere. We're moving through a landscape, and we put these things out, preferably at the cell phone towers, but also we use riverbeds and other places. And it's a dynamic experience. It's, you know, you would probably need a very artistic um, film cameraman to ever be able to really give an idea of that experience because uh, it's quite exciting. You can see here that was in the Karoo 
um, um, semi-desert in, in South Africa, hazy sky, but the first tumulus cloud is already forming. So that is already the beginning of the energy transformation. You can see now in the next picture there are already two. It becomes more, but we are also moving, so we are going into still um, untransformed um, territory. We are leaving this behind as we move on. But you can see how the sky is transforming. So that's a sequence of maybe two hours and 150 kilometers of movement. Then what we've seen very often is sylphs. Now we're get, becoming a bit more metaphysical because a lot of people feel that sylphs are the cloud expression of spiritual beings that live in the sky. And we get to see a lot of them and sometimes we have the impression that they are saying thank you for the work that we have done. Now, this, is, this could still be dismissed as Ah, he's just showing us some pictures of clouds, you know. I mean, it can mean anything. The only thing why I think it constitutes proof is because we always say, see the change from the one state into the other and not from the other into the one. A very simple and convincing way to prove the efficacy of Orgonite is plant growth experiments, and they have been done all over the world. This one was published in the um, British magazine Strange Days um, by our friend Mark Bennett. It shows plants that were grown with and plants that were grown without Orgonite. I think you can guess which ones are the ones that were grown with Orgonite. This was done by a gentleman called Alex in Quebec, Canada, who has a website, Orgon Art. I'm sh not sure if it's still active but these pictures are still around. He did a systematic experiment of growing um, marrows with and without organite, otherwise very similar conditions. Obviously, this one is the field with the organite. We did a little experiment um, ourselves that was to prove two things. Firstly, all of you have probably heard by now that water is a carrier of energies and information. So, we used three water samples. So, I'm, I'm actually referring to the work of Masaru Emoto, who is probably the most well-known pioneer of, of water energy research. We used two cell phones calling each other for half an hour with and without protection. So I'm showing here the little organite chips that we use. Um, obviously, we, we later put them up in the same position, like the unprotected sample, um, and we radiated a water sample, a one liter carafe, for half an hour. Sample one, two mobile phones without protection. Sample two, two mobile phones with our mini shield, Sample three, ordinary tap water untreated as it comes out of the tap. Then we sprouted chickpeas in the same way, all standing next to each other on the same kitchen counter, same light, same temperature. Standard procedure, you, you pour the water in, you leave it for 15 minutes or something like that, then you pour the excess off. And we did that over five days. Now. The unprotected sample turned out to look sick. Interestingly, they grew faster in the beginning, so I was almost like, I thought, oh my God, maybe it's going to prove that the, the cell phone is good for the, <laughs> for the chickpeas. Um, but it seemed to be more like, a, you know, like chemotherapy also seems to make people healthier in the beginning, but it's in the end killing them. So... The peas were trying to grow fast because they wanted to get ahead. But then after five days, the ones uh, with the unprotected um, cell phones were already slimy, getting a bit rotten. 
They were brownish and they were underdeveloped. They had, you can actually see the scale here, this was 148 grams. The protected sample with the um, organite at the cell phones, 165, and they had the biggest amount of little green shoots and they looked very healthy and vital. The untreated tap water came out slightly in the middle. So what it actually shows is that by putting organite at this source of hard radiation or door, you're actually creating an organ generator and you're creating a situation that is better than this, the, the neutral situation. That's quite interesting. A gentleman from Australia sent us this photo where he photographed one of these in a dark uh, room with Kirlian photography, so the things do have an aura. Now, another level of proof is what I call shamanic endorsement. We have on our travels encountered lots of traditional healers in Africa. Credo Mutwa is probably known to you, but many others as well. Um, Dr. Chipangula, for example, is the president of the Traditional Healers Association in Malawi, of which I've become a honorary member. And um, Dr. Chipangula, in fact, adopted our technology and started distributing organite all over the small and beautiful country of Malawi. Seven of these cloud busters and about 2,000 of these distributed all over the country through the network of 200,000 traditional healers. The country was then earmarked for food insecurity, um, massive intervention of NGOs, new American military base, and so on and so on. So there was talk of, of uh, impending hunger catastrophe. My latest information from Malawi is not only that they had abundant rainfalls, but that they've started planting second crops, winter crops, which they haven't done for the last 40 years. So... It works. Another proof is that a group of African activists based in Kenya have adopted the Orgonite and started to make it into a viable business. They go to farmers, small, small African farmers, who are very happy with the results, also fishermen, because they find they, the fish become more abundant, the, the crops are growing uh, a lot better. But they haven't stopped by this agricultural, but the agricultural application is their business. That's what finances them. But they've also gone into the conflict zones of southern Somalia, um, South Sudan, and eastern Congo, and observed the pacifying effect of Orgonite. This is very difficult to prove, you know, but we observe it again and again that there is a consciousness effect of massive deployment of organite in a conflict zone will make it more likely that those forces that are constructive and want a positive way out. I'm not saying, you know, a warlord will still be a warlord. He will still have his Kalashnikov and so on. Even a career criminal remains a career criminal. But as the, the energy field changes, the likelihood of somebody turning into that career maybe becomes a little bit less and the likelihood of somebody standing up and saying, hey, why are we actually fighting? Couldn't we maybe do something more productive? So also an African farmer has little money. He is more zönig than a Nederlander and, <laughs> and the proverbial Scotsman. So before an African farmer who works hard to earn a measly few, few uh, Ugandan shillings or whatever for his produce before he parts with hard-earned money and buys something like that, he has to be convinced that it works. So to me, that's the, the, the self-feeding um, success of these uh, African activists is another element of proof. Um, so... Weather changes. I think I've mentioned a few uh, on the side. Um, a lot of 
panic was created in 2003, 2004. There were um, frontline news on, in the Johannesburg Star that 10, 10 million people were supposed, I'm saying supposed because I think it was a plan behind it, um, were expected, prognosticated to die in the countries of Zambia and Zimbabwe. None of that happened because our approach is when we hear of a drought, we don't think that, it's, that it should be there, we immediately take action. We go there and the drought doesn't happen. That's, that's basically um, what we're doing. Then in 2004 we did an operation that we called De Operation Desert Rain. Um, we put about five of these cloud busters and about a thousand or so of these thingies. And after that the whole weather changed in Namibia. They had the biggest rainfalls in, in the beginning of 2005 that were ever recorded in the history of meteorology of Namibia, which is probably going back to Kaiser Wilhelm and 1880, 1980, uh, no, 1880 or so when they brought in the first records of, of, of weather. Actually, somebody sent me a photo of snow in the Namib desert the other day, which I found very pretty. And <laughs> I think that hasn't been seen there in maybe 50 years. Surprising greenness in the Karoo. Karoo is another very dry area, traditionally, in the center of South Africa. Um, the same for the Kalahari in Botswana. Rivers are starting to flow. Um, Lakes are filling up, water levels in the Okavango. The Okavango Delta is a beautiful area that is, um, you know, very important for tourism. Prince Harry and the, all the royals have their special hideouts there. Um, it's an ecosystem where a river, the Okavango River, actually fans out into the desert, and it's the only desert that is not connected to an ocean, the only delta that is not connected to an ocean. And it's seasonal flooding beautiful wildlife, crocodiles, giraffes, elephants, uh, what, whatever, and ecologists and nature conservationists were actually predicting that the Okavango Delta would disappear in the next 10, 20 years because of water usage for mining and the general desiccating drought trend that we broke, that, that is not existing anymore. So at the moment, the Okavango is actually about an, an average eight meter higher than it used to be. And some of the safari camps had to be abandoned because they are on low-lying um, islands. So, um, yeah, water levels, snow in the Namib. Um, other people who are observant of their environment told me in the Western Cape, for example, that after we did some work there, the weather patterns that they were used to in their childhood and that had disappeared over the last 20, 30 years had returned to what they used to be or what they should be. Um, this, these are some uh, newspaper clippings of uh, the extra rains in Namibia. This is a so-called desert here. Um, here you see in 2006 the average rainfall the dark blue indicates more than 200% of long-year average, okay? The blue is 100 to 200% and the light blue is um, 50 to 100%. You see um, under average rainfall here in the Western Cape, but it is not very significant because South Africa is a... Um, the, the Western Cape has a different normal rainfall pattern. It's got uh, winter rain. So the fact that in summer there was little rainfall doesn't say much, but this is the normal rainy season up there on, the, on that central uh, page. And you can see that over more than 30%, you get more than 200% of the normal rainfall. Okay, what I'm going to show you now is basically a run-through of our, the development of our project that we call Organize Africa. Um, I've been documenting the deployment of Organite 
by using a GPS so that I have an idea of where we've been and where we still need to go. That's the humble beginnings. Um, the first tours that we made branching out from Johannesburg. Um, you see the thing is getting more than, for example, um, how am I doing time-wise, by the way? Hmm? Do I need to... Out of time? Okay, okay. So let me just run through this quickly. Um, this is just showing, giving you ideas of where we went. We also hired airplanes and gifted water. Um, some of the towers on the way. See the blue is spreading. Then we started discovering water gifting, which means that we went on cruises or we even used our own motorboat in order to lay a string of orgonite around the tip of southern Africa. This um, orgon string in the sea has now extended to more than 4,000 kilometers. This gentleman visited me from the United States. He has the extraordinary ability to see energy vortices from 30 meters, kilometers afar. So we did a very special uh, journey together where we gifted all these um, energy vortices where energy comes out of the ground. Um, some more of our tours. Dolphins love Orgonite, interestingly. Um, you can see the blue dots becoming more and more. Some of our water gifting tours in our own boat and in, on cruise ships. This is Lake Malawi using the, the ferry there that goes up and down. This is Dr. Chipangula with us when we visited him again. Um, we had some interesting experience on our way. We were apprehended as terrorists in Mozambique for allegedly uh, trying to sabotage the Kaura Basadam. Um, I believe that the nasty secret services instigated the otherwise friendly Mozambicans to give us a bit of a hard time. So we spent 53 days in custody with 75 people in one cell of 7 by 5 meters with no bedding whatsoever. And we were, because we were terrorists, we were with the awaiting trial for murder and manslaughter. So, but they respected us. They said, oh no, these motherfuckers are dangerous. They're terrorists. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I had one friend there who is very good in martial arts. He knows ninjutsu and so on. And he said to me, okay, don't be afraid, George. The first 10 will die. <laughs> they are boys. So. <laughs> So that was a cultural experience. These are, these are actually, that is, that is our team here. That's, that's uh, Prophet from South Africa. This is uh, Carlo from Portugal. And this is Tino Putejo, Air Force Major and Ninjitsu. So don't fuck with him. And that's me with a beard here in the, in the prison. Uh, they, unfortunately, they deleted all our photos. It was very difficult to get the cameras back because they wanted to steal them personally. <laughs> anyway, so then in 2010, we gifted all the stadiums for the World Cup because we thought that maybe they would try something funny. You know, they sometimes love to disrupt large gatherings with so-called terrorist attacks. Nothing happened. Uh, um, World Cup went very nicely, although Holland didn't win and Germany also not. <laughs> <But> <laughs> and South Africa not at all. I mean, yeah, we tried. <laughs> but it was a very good atmosphere. And now you see um, some work that we did recently. We also visited the concentration camps in Poland to do something about this ongoing trauma. This picture shows the theory that the major uh, um, concentration camps are actually on a, on a pentagram that connects to negative ley lines connecting to other satanic uh, ritual sacrifice sites. So you see here Auschwitz, Auschwitz-Birkenau, um, Treblinka and Sobibor. 
Um, so this year we've been to Egypt a few times and recently done a trip of Botswana just to complete our, our network there. So you can see the blue is becoming more dense. I'm not going to show you this movie because I'm out of time. Now, and also the, the professionals here have told me it's bad quality, so not, uh, it's all on my website. I want to show you quickly how to make this stuff because um, I think this is the message that this is something that everybody can do. This is how we make tower busters. You get a simple muffin form. You put a small bedding of, of aluminum filings. You put a few crystals. They can be um, fragments. They don't have to be beautiful. So, you know, as you get like crystals by the kilo, you, you use the nice ones for the more sophisticated tools and you use the breakage for the tower busters. So you can use them all. You, Brazil. Hmm? Brazil is beautiful. No, we try to get them from Africa. <laughs> but now the Chinese are buying all the crystals, you know, so it's becoming more and more difficult. So <laughs> also the prices are going up. So then, then we put additional um, things in there. We, we like to put pyrite and we like to put uh, amethyst. It doesn't have to be the super quality stuff. I mean, it doesn't have to be the optical um, 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 jewelry grade stuff. It, it can be... Um, ordinary and then we mix the resin and we pour it in and then we wait 30 minutes and take them out and that's it. This is how you make one of these. That's how we used to make them because now we have nicer molds but you can use a, a simple household funnel and close the, the, um, the outflow. At that point I was using window putty to, to make that um, plug and then you put the crystal that is supposed to stick in the top, you, you embed it in a bit of filings and then you fill it like half and you put the four crystals that are pointing outwards and then you, you embed it in, in more filings and I'm almost finished, yes. And there is how you make a cloud buster. Um, it's all on my website, so uh, the website is here. And self-empowerment start gifting. So start with your house, put four tower busters in the corners of your property, one at the incoming main water pipe, one in the electrical DB box, and then you start sorting out the cell phone towers in your immediate environment. So you start creating a safe space in concentric circles, starting from your personal protection to doing something for your wider environment. And if you are a free energy inventor, you need 200 tower busters around you in order to protect you against interference. That's my personal advice. <laughs> I've got about... Okay, 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 finished. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs>